and hello again and here we are again i wonder at what point does something unusual become normal or the new normal because it does kind of feel like that now doesn't it where you got into a pattern of behavior i suppose one of the concerns is going to be and we might think about this next week but one of the concerns is going to be uh, what do we do when this is all over and done with when normality returns when people are going out and about freely again we're not feeling restricted or limited in any way it's for some people it's going to be really hard for some people and maybe you you're going to feel that actually you're so used to staying in so used to not mixing with people that it'll feel uncomfortable to go out and to mix with people again there is a simple thought or a single thought at the moment which is why i say we might come back to it next week in my mind that perhaps one of the things we should be doing as a church now is praying about the opportunities that there will be for us to engage with people and recognizing that we have a responsibility not to keep ourselves closeted away but to go out into the world to connect with people and to bring the truth and the light and the hope of jesus in a clear way and maybe that will help us to see that you know, when you're tempted to go, I don't really want to go out again. Maybe you don't even want to go to church again. I want to stay at home and be safe. To recognize that we have a calling to go out and to engage and to mix with people. And maybe that calling is already being unpacked in your life. Just a passing thought. But good morning. Here we are again. And I thought this week we might just, one final thought, picking up on that whole sort of, Pentecost, the promises of Ascension Day, the prayer, the fulfillment, the Holy Spirit coming, that whole sort of idea. One final thought about that. So let's pray. We thank you, Lord, because you are with us. And in every moment of every day, you desire to draw us forward in you. And the truth is that there are things which come into our lives which hold us back, which make us slip, which trip us up. But we thank you today that you do not hold those things against us, but rather offer to us an ongoing experience of forgiveness through repentance, that we might perpetually start again but also that we might increasingly leave behind that which has held us back in the past and move forward into what you have for us in the future help us to grasp this today that we might grow in you and in being filled with your spirit amen and like i say we had the the whole thing of the promises of ascension day and so on and then the holy spirit like we said last week <coughs> excuse me the holy spirit comes and peter is is transformed i mean they're all transformed but peter in particular is transformed by the spirit he's no longer denying knowledge of jesus he's no longer hiding away he's no longer fearful in a corner somewhere now he stands and he preaches and he proclaims god's word with a message that resonates and three thousand people come to faith and we talk i know we mentioned this last week but i just want to pick up on something today because they came to faith in a way that was not half-hearted so often these days people come to faith and and is there really that much of a difference is there really that much of a change? But they, their experience of coming to faith, those 3,000 people on that day of Pentecost that responded to the sermon, they came to faith and it wasn't a half-hearted thing. Look what it says, Acts chapter 2 and verses 42 onwards. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And all... Now here's the thing, all came on every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings, 
and distributing to the proceeds to all as any had need. I ever been in a church like that? <laughs> Indeed. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. <coughs> their experience as a church was transformed by the power of the Spirit. But their experience as a church was a genuine, deep, and life-changing experience. It wasn't a gradual step-by-step, -step, learning little steps along the way, falling back and then pressing. That first church, that first response to the preaching of God's Word underneath the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that first experience was transformatory. And there is something that I think that is at the heart of that that we, if we're honest, don't talk about much these days. You see, these days, we talk about people coming to faith, which is fair enough. We talk about people coming to belief, the journey of faith. And so we should. We need to understand that with people, it is a progressive thing. It, if people move, you know, big yes, little yes, healthy maybe, as Mark Greenwood would say. People move along a journey of coming to faith. They, they do. But there is something that perhaps in focusing on that, we have neglected a little in recent years. Because what we often don't talk about these days is something that the early church made a foundational, a key, a bottom line, a rubber hits the road starting point for everybody. If you look at Acts chapter 2, before we get to the bit where they were transformed and they were having all things in common and they were giving to people according to their need and they were devoted to etc 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 before you get to that bit in verse 37 it says when the people heard this the message that peter brought they were cut to the heart and said to peter and the other apostles brothers what shall we do and Peter replied and said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The message was, Repent and be baptized. The message wasn't, Believe and try to be good and say you're sorry. It was repent. Now, in truth, <coughs> repent is not a popular word, is it, really? You see, the trouble with telling people that they need to repent and be baptized, the trouble with saying that to people is that it shines a light on our sin. It shines a light on our failing. But, we have to recognize that the first message, the very first message that the Holy Spirit inspires in the new church calls to people not to believe, not to go to church, not to join a group. doesn't even say, read your Bible and learn about Jesus. The first message that the Holy Spirit proclaims to a needy world is repent, turn from where you are now, and give yourself to Jesus, be baptized, and go in a different direction. It's the rain. And this applies initially but also subsequently. The call is repent so that you can move on from death into a place of life that he would give. 
And it applies in that first instance when we come to faith, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we had no belief in Jesus. And the call is, repent, follow Jesus, and move into all that he has for you by the power of the Spirit. But also, you know when you struggle with a cycle of behavior that we know is wrong, that we know offends God, that we know hurts others, that we know limits our ability to come into his presence, that we know brings guilt and shame to our lives. Repentance is the way to break that cycle. Peter used the word repent. And the people who were there in Jerusalem, they were good Jewish people. They knew exactly what he meant because repentance was a very clear message in the Old Testament. Time and time again, they are called to repent, to turn from their wicked ways, to follow once again the Lord, to abandon that which had deceived them and that which had seduced them into following a way of sin and to turn and follow the way of righteousness. Again and again, you hear that through the Old Testament. You heard it with John the Baptist as well. John the Baptist, there he was, out in the Jordan, camel skin, locusts and honey, well, it's amazing the things that people will eat during lockdown, isn't it? But <clears throat> there he was, crying to people as they went past, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And the idea is a very clear one for those people, perhaps less clear for us. The word is metanoio. What does it mean? It means to Repent to turn, to be different. But why might that idea of repentance have given such strength to the experience of God and the Holy Spirit that the early church had that first evangelistic opportunity where Peter preaches? There's a thing called the five R's of repentance. It's been around for a while. I think the first time I came across it was in a book oh, like years ago, back in the day when we used books to prepare sermons. Remember those days? You know, back <laughs> as opposed to the internet, but back then. And it, it's, it, if you look for it, if you do a search for it online, it is all over the internet. Five elements of true repentance. And I saw something um, just last week that reminded me of them and then also reminded me that Jesus told a parable that ideally illustrates these five elements of repentance. And it's the parable of the prodigal son. We know the story. This guy's got two sons. The youngest one takes a look at his brother and sees that his brother is going to inherit the farm, quite literally inherit the farm <clears throat> so he says to his dad rather than hang around till you die dad just give me what's coming to me and i'll go and make my own way in the world and he takes his inheritance and he pushes off to a foreign land and the parable tells us he lives a life of riotous living and gathers around him friends who love him and who are supportive to him and are loyal to him right up until the moment when his money runs out and when his money runs out his friends abandon him and he ends up looking after pigs which you know for a Jew mm, mm, not really the ideal career move he's so hungry he ends up eating the food that is there for the pigs and sitting in the midst of that he thinks I'll go back to me dad's because even if he only accepts me back as a servant I'm going to be better off than I am now so he goes home and as he's traveling home, his dad is looking out for him. And dad comes running down the road and embraces him and throws a party and celebrates. Because his son, who was dead, is now alive, is restored, is brought home. And it is, of course, an image of God's view for us. But in the prodigal son, in the story of the prodigal son, we have the five elements of repentance. You see, because the first thing he does is he recognizes 
the wrong that he has done. He recognizes the sin that he has committed. And the first element of, of repentance is to recognize what we have done wrong. Recognize where we have fallen short. Recognize our sin. And that is really hard to do. Because what happens when you do something wrong? And you, you, look, at, and, you know, look at the life of a child and the way that a child reacts when they're in trouble. What is the first thing they do? They justify their behavior. They explain it away. They rationalize. Well, he did it first or she hit me or whatever. They rationalize it. And we do exactly the same. We stand before God and we, we, we rationalize our, our behavior, our attitudes, our, our thoughts, our, our words. And we, we, just, we explain them away. We justify them. We call it weakness. We call it a moment's lapse. Satan made me do it <clears throat> on some occasions. But until we admit, until we recognize our failings, our sin, recognize the damage that it is doing, see the consequences of doing something that stands between us and God, and see the consequences eternally, and now, until we can recognize the reality that there is behavior that gets in the way of us walking with God and knowing the truth of him and recognize that behavior for what it is, until we do that, we will never be different. Because we don't see it as a problem. Not really. Oh, we might see it as an inconvenience. We might see it as something that occasionally prompts a bit of, of sort of guilty feeling, guilty conscience. But the first step to turn our lives around, to see the reality of Jesus, and to walk in the freedom and the power of his Holy Spirit in our day-to-day -day experience, the first step of repentance is to recognize we need to be willing to see the truth about ourselves. And the truth about ourselves is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we need to be saved from the consequences of that our sin. And that salvation comes through repentance. And believing in Jesus. And walking in his spirit. <clears throat> we need to be willing to see the truth about ourselves if we are to grow into the life that Jesus wants to give us. And if you are uncertain about whether behaviors are appropriate or not, whether they are sin, whether they need to be repented of, if you're uncertain, just pause and ask the Holy Spirit. Because part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. If you're not sure if your behavior is pleasing to God, ask the Holy Spirit and he will tell you. Recognition, that's the first thing. The second R of repentance is regret. Where we see the truth of what we have done and we regret it. We feel guilt about it. Sorrow for it. The prodigal son looked at his life and he went, what on earth, Luke 15, verse 18, what on earth have I, I'm paraphrasing, what on earth have I done? Why have I done this? And here's the truth. Part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to us why we should be sorry for the lives that we live and the things that we do. Recognition, regret, resolve, because the third part of repentance, see, repentance isn't just about saying sorry. Repentance isn't just about realizing we've done wrong. Repentance is about resolving to make a change. Deciding in our mind, in our will, in our heart, deciding to be different. The prodigal son says, I will go back to my, I will not remain here in this sorry state. I will go back to my father. I mean, that's redolent of message and thought, isn't it? But he resolved to make a change. To repent 
means to change your mind to choose to turn and walk in a different way to choose to recognize where it's wrong to regret the reality of where our life is ending up as a consequence and to resolve to be different to choose to turn and walk a different way and then to do it because the fourth r of repentance is reformation to reform your life you see so many people they come and they express faith in jesus and they say i believe in jesus but nothing ever changes and they wonder why their life is frustrated and shallow and lacking in spiritual strength and power i mean for goodness sake in the early church they were in awe of the signs and wonders the reality of god that was poured into that place and we wonder why we haven't got this sort of stuff in our lives well very often it's because we're not really repenting of the things that are wrong we allow them to stay because the fourth r is reformation to reform your life to take on a new pattern of living to start to do things differently john chapter 12 shows us in verse 42 and 43 it shows us that people can believe but not change but the prodigal son he chose i will return to my father's house and they got up off his backside he left the pig sitting and he went home he went he did something about it he moved forward think about and it wasn't easy for him i mean let's be honest that wasn't there was a long journey there was shame there was embarrassment there was fear that he might be rejected all of that but he chose to do what was right and he chose to follow that path and it took sacrifice and it took an effort but you know think about all those verses that are in the bible about doing what god says we should they that love me will keep my commandments jesus said all those verses about taking on god's ways all those verses about conforming ourselves not to the world but to his way it doesn't just happen it doesn't you don't just wake up one morning and go oh look at me i am now a perfect christian that's not how it happens it didn't happen for the disciples it was a lifelong journey for them the only person that ever happened to was jesus because he started off perfect it's not easy but you see in the same way as the holy spirit comes to help us see and convict us of what is wrong so that we can recognize it in the same way that the holy spirit comes to to show to us why we should be sorry and enable us to regret our sin the same way the holy spirit comes to strengthen our understanding so that we can resolve to be different the same way the holy spirit comes and is sent as a helper so that we can reform our lives and the fifth the fifth is restitution you see when we see it when we regret it when we resolve to be different when we start to change part of that change has to be to put it where we can to put it right Zacchaeus met with Jesus and then went out and put it right with all the people he could that he had defrauded the prodigal comes to his father and he says i have wronged you i am not worthy to be called your son now let's be honest there are some things we cannot put right there are some coals that are better left unraked but to fully repent we need to be willing when we do wrong to people we need to be willing to put it right and although in the first instance when we come to faith we can't necessarily go back and correct all the things that we've done in our life in the days before maybe we can't go back and and dot every i and cross every t maybe we can't do that but see when we are walking as people of faith and we do wrong and we repent of that at number five restitution putting it right to people we need to do that if you have sinned against your brother the bible says go to them and put it right don't let it lie between you Just go to them and put it right if they won't accept you doing that that's on them restitution the five 
hours of repentance. And I'm not saying that we should condemn ourselves. I'm the last person to say that we should condemn ourselves or that we should condemn one another. But the five hours of repentance give us a very clear message. And the first message preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit was clear. It was repent, not regret, not try to be different, not... Yeah, it was repent, the five elements of repentance, and be baptized and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. It was turn from where you are through repentance. Walk in the freedom that comes from giving yourself to Jesus and receiving his Spirit. Maybe the reason that so many of us struggle to go forward is because we have never really turned away from that which held control on our lives if we are to truly be free in jesus we need to take on board this message of repentance you see to truly know jesus we need to repent of our sin give ourselves to him baptism and let his spirit fill us if we are truly to know the life now abundant in christ we need to do that and because we are not perfect and because we falter and fall if we are to really know jesus in our living as christians we need to daily repent and give ourselves to him and walk in his spirit repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit let's pray and I'd like you just to take a moment right now because it's very easy to go to the oh we've got to the pray bit we can just switch off now but before you do that just take a moment to stop Holy Spirit help us to see anything in our lives which blights our walk with Jesus help us to truly regret that thing and be filled with sorrow for it Help us to see and to find the strength to determine and choose today that whatever those things are, we will from now on be different. Give us all that we need to put that resolve into practice and reform our lives. And give us the courage to live in a way that honors you in the lives of others. Help us to live a life that where sin, failing, the things that are wrong in your sight impinge upon our living, Lord. Help us to live a daily life of repentance that doesn't just say sorry, and please forgive me but recognizes that we turn away from those things so that every time we turn we turn towards a further step down the road of freedom and power and wonder in your Holy Spirit in Jesus name Amen <laughs>